Please note that this content is for adults only. Viewer discretion advised. If you haven't yet, hit the subscribe, like and share. Hello everyone and welcome back to another live stream with me, Gizzela K. This is Grizzly True Crime and happy Sunday to you. Today we're going to be talking about the Delphi case. As um, Defense Diary says, it's the case that never sleeps. Unfortunately, there's always so much happening and one would want it to happen, but for progress towards justice for Abby and Libby. And it just, it's, a re it's been a really rocky road. The trial is set for October 15th of 2024. I hope it happens then. Hopefully there'll be more answers then, right? Um, <laughs> welcome to all my mods. Thank you so much for everything you do. Welcome to all my patrons. I've uh, uploaded a picture today of my new setup, you know, in the apartment because we moved, as you know. And welcome to all my members. We are going to have a Grizzly YouTube members only live stream right after this one. So you should be teleported there. And we'll expand on some of the things that we're going to discuss here today. I want to show you a longer clip of something. Um, so welcome to everyone. Welcome to all my subscribers as well. There's lots of new faces here. So if you've been a Grizzly for a while, you know that over here we keep it Grizzly. That's what we say, right? Kind, respectful, not combative, not fighting with each other, not leading streams other places or talking off topic. We are a pretty focused group, you know. So just know that there's a lot of new people here. They might not quite know yet how we roll, but they will eventually. And I know that the mods always do their best and I also do my best. So don't get upset if it's not quite the same. I think we've had like 10,000 new people in the last 20 days, which is a lot. You know, there's a lot of new Grizzlies here. Welcome to all of you. I hope that you'll see how we roll. <laughs> okay, so today I've got a little presentation for you. I got some video clips to show you. And then of course, there's a couple of documents. Now what I've done is because as I've told you, it's a mountain of documents that have come out in the last uh how many days now today is february 25th okay and the last time i reported on a, on a document was february 7th so since then goodness me lots of documents have come out i can't <laughs> i can't give up <laughs> i was like yeah no, okay i'm gonna get to it i'm gonna get to it because we were busy watching the adam montgomery trial together you know and then the more time went on the more documents came out so i finally had a chance to look at all of them this weekend and get all caught up and I'm going to bring you the summaries. Okay, we can't sit here reading through all of them line by line. <laughs> we'll be here for literally forever. Um, Vicky W and all the members that joined today, welcome to you. Thank you so much for being members. Just know I never expected. If you are subscribed, you're a grizzly. Okay, guys? Because some people don't know. They ask me, am I a grizzly if I'm subscribed? Yes. Just subscribe. It's free. You're a grizzly. Okay? So please like and share, hashtag justice for Abby and Libby, or you could say hashtag justice for Libby and Abby, whichever way around. Hashtag Delphi would be good as well. And let others know that we are live right now. So first up, let me just bring up my presentation with my very quick um, overview, you know, a little recap, because there are so many new faces here. And while many of us have heard this recap or, you know, so many times, you know the case very well, some people might not know it, okay? So on February, 13th of 2017, 14 year old Liberty German and 13 year old Abigail Williams had the day off from school. It was like a snow day and they had a sleepover the night before and they made pancakes the next day. They're just like normal teenagers. They thought, what are we going to do? What are we going to do today? Right? So they were discussing their plans and then eventually asked um, Libby's sister, can you drop us off at the trails? And then they asked their dad to pick them up later, which would have been around three. So they weren't even going to be there for very long. It was just an afternoon walk on the trails and over the bridge, right? So they decided to go for this afternoon walk on the Monon Trails and this Monon High Bridge, which has now been completely renovated as well. So it doesn't look um, as scary as it did before. It looked very like wobbly and wonky. It was old. I think they call it like a trestle bridge, right? And they'd walked across there and apparently Abby was pretty nervous. She hadn't, I've heard that she hadn't, she possibly hadn't been all the way across before and you know, Libby had been over a few times, is what her sister said. So she was like, okay, okay. And they took photos, they took Snapchats and things. And then they asked on some of the audio that they took, is that creeper still following us? So there's this creepy guy that was following them while they were on this walk. Okay. And so Libby actually caught this guy known as Bridge Guy on her phone. 
And so that is the, the blurry one second video that we have called Bridge Guy. And then we also have some audio, Guys Down the Hill. Now, some people still speculate that Guys and Down the Hill are two different people or that it's in different orders, Down the Hill, Guys. I don't know. I mean, at this point, how, how, will, we, how will anyone know for sure unless they're going to just stick to, I don't know, confirmation bias. Just be like, this is what I believe, this is what I know, this is what it is. We don't know. <laughs> There's so much that we don't know. And I think it's very important to remember that at this point, because you know how it goes. There's many cases that we've studied beforehand and then we get to the trial and we learn so much more. Of course, that's how it would go, right? And especially in this case, they've kept a lot close to the vest for many, many years. And there's a gag order now. So now when all these people come out the woodworks and, you know, there's new information, all sorts of things coming out, just, just take it with a grain of salt, right? Jean has been a member for 20 months. Thank you so, so much. So... Um, their bodies were discovered the next day on Ron Logan's property. Now, Ron Logan, it's almost like back to the drawing board. Like, it's unbelievable that we're back to square one to discuss Ron Logan again. Because there's been a new documentary that was made by, it's called Crime Nation. And I think it's made by News Nation's company, right? And so we're back to speculation of Ron Logan. Now, what I want to say is, hey, I'm all for looking at things again, you know, um, keeping an open mind always, never being like, no, this is definitely it, and this is definitely the killer. We, don't, <laughs> we just don't know that. However, I must say, with Ron Logan, the police looked into him, the FBI looked into him, they searched his property twice, and then that was it, right? And if Ron Logan was the guy... Why would the defense not go with that angle? That would be so easy. It would be so easy. Oh my goodness. If I was a defense attorney and there really was something there, I'd be like, oh, it's so Ron Logan because Ron Logan died in January of 2022. How easy would it be to pin this on a dead guy? So I'm just like, yeah, we just got to be a little bit cautious there. But hey, I am always, you know, ready to have an open mind, to take in the information, to hear new information. Let's see. And of course, Richard Allen, the suspect, is innocent till proven guilty. And there's been a lot of sus things surrounding Richard Allen and the way he's been treated and things happening with the defense attorneys that we've gone over <laughs> so much, okay? Um, anyway, so there's been many persons of interest over the years, including Ron Logan. In October of 2022, they arrested Richard Allen, the guy that worked at CVS. That one. Okay, his trial is set for October 15th of 2024. All right. So that uh, <laughs> Joe Morris says, yep, easy to pin it all on the dead man. Now look at the persons of interest in the past. Some of them law enforcement sounded pretty damn sure of. <laughs> and then they're like, oh, okay, yeah, no, not that one, not that one. Like Daniel Nations, look at Charles Eldridge, Paul Etter, James Chadwell, Garrett Kurtz, Thomas Bruce, Kegan Klein, Keggy Keggy Klein. Remember him with his canvas skills? <laughs> and then Richard Allen. And of course, yeah, we've also got Toe Blazenby. There's Doug Carter. There's Ron Logan. I mean, I think we all believe different things, but no matter what we believe in, we have to wait for the evidence to know what really happened here. And I really hope that there will be justice for Abby and Libby. I really hope that they will get to the truth because I know that from the outside looking in and the world is watching, it really looks like they've been trying to find a suspect for the longest time because they really went hard down that road of Kagan Klein and his dad, Tony Klein. They even connected them to the tip line. Remember with the... Anthony Schott's account and the purple PT Cruiser that Kagan Klein's grandmother had. There's so much with every angle you look at. It's hard to then actually rule these people out. In fact, one could plausibly still say they're all involved. <laughs> like in my mind, that's where I feel safest is to say, okay, if Richard Allen's involved, then so is Ron Logan and Kagan Klein and his dad and everybody we've looked at because it's just like, we haven't seen evidence, especially with a gag order, that you can just rule them out. That no, it's definitely not them because of this and this and this. You know, like with Ken Klein saying he was, waiting at, he was waiting in a red Jeep while someone else was committing the murders at this marathon gas station and then the FBI lost lost whatever the, the gas station surveillance. And now here we go again. Now there's the Odinus theory as well, right? Which the defense is going for. And, and so the defense is finding hard to get that video footage. And guess what? They don't have it. They lost it. How interesting, though, that they interviewed these Odinists by, within four days of finding the bodies. Isn't that weird that they went and interviewed these guys 
BH and PW, who do say they sacrifice horses, by the way, and Ron Logan did breed horses. So I'm just saying, one could really go all in, in any way you like. With any theory, we could go on the deepest dive down that rabbit hole and never come out. <laughs> so all we can really do is report on the facts that we can see, like, documents and timelines and think about it and have civil conversations but we just don't know and I don't think there's any point in getting angry about it because I find a lot of times it's like this is a tribe and this is over here and you on which side are you on and like I don't know I'm just like I, again I say at least now I live in a neutral country huh <laughs> it makes sense I'm in Switzerland <laughs> I'm staying neutral I don't know I do not know the answers and definitely not being so far away I think a lot of the Delphi locals know a lot more than even many of us know, right? I was watching um, Delphi After Dark, Rick Snay. He makes a lot of sense to me. When I watch his stuff, I'm like, that makes a lot of sense. Very open-minded, intelligent conversation, not combative, not I'm right and this is it. I like that, okay? Let me quickly finish the poll here. Uh, do you think Ron Logan is a suspect in this case? Before we get into this, 29% of you guys said yes, he is bridge guy and the killer. Okay, 13% said yes, he's bridge guy, not the killer. Interesting. 35% said not bridge guy, but is involved. And 23% said not at all. I would almost say, I would almost lean towards he's bridge guy and not the killer. <laughs> or not bridge guy, but is involved. Because how weird that the girl's bodies were found on his property. His alibi did not check out. You know, he, there are receipts from him going to buy tropical f uh, fish that day. But that was later. It takes half an hour to get to that place. It was later. So he could have actually been there. And you know when people say, but Richard Allen said that he was there that day. <laughs> well, Ron Logan's phone said that he was there that day. Okay. Around that area on his property. And then if you say, but Richard Allen said he was wearing the same thing. Okay. But Ron Logan was literally wearing that the next day on an interview. Like, and then everyone says, well, half of Indiana guys wear that. Well, then the argument should go both ways. You know what I mean? Anyway, okay, I hope I'm making sense. JFH said, happy, oh, happy early birthday, Gizla. Nice, you are 310. Just wanted to say, you know you have more subscribers than a certain former pro <laughs> prosecutor? Than a certain former prosecutor. Do I know? Spill the tea. Okay, thank you so much. So this is a picture of Ron Logan. Look, he did this interview pretty much the next day. Wearing the blue jacket. He's got the same hat. He's like, literally looks like him. He walks like him. You know when you say, it walks like a duck, <laughs> talks like a duck, is it the duck? I don't know. People even say that the height and I, as I say to Mr. Grizzly, I'm not an engineer. <laughs> I just, I haven't done the height calculations, okay? But people have done reenactments and height calculations. And many people say, no, no, the height of Richard Allen, he's too short to be a bridge guy. I don't know, okay? I don't know. I'm just saying the argument can't just work one way or not the other because he wears that. He walks like that. He walks on the bridge, his property's right there. <laughs> and he was at his property that day at 2.09 p.m. You know, could be a four minute walk to the bridge. I don't know, it's from the wrong direction, but you just never know. So I like to keep an open mind, but yes, of course, the police have a suspect. But do you think if they found more, because remember when they dug in the um, fire pit at Tony Klein's house in Keg and Klein? Well, and then they were there in the Wabash River. Do you think they were trying to frame him or trying to find something with him or trying to find that he was part of this group? I don't know. How are we going to know? And we can't hear, especially from Superintendent Dakota, we can't hear anything from the families. There's a gag order. But anyway, I wanted to show you a picture of Ron Logan. There's a picture of him next to that walking. And then we've got Bridge Guy. You know? <laughs> Carla's like, walks like a duck, talks like a duck. It's a mallard. <laughs> right? So Caroline says there's nothing distinctive about the clothing. It's close to generic. Any blue collar community has dozens of guys who dress like that. Exactly. But then people like to say, no, 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 no. Richard Allen said he was wearing that blue jacket. Okay, but so was half of Indiana. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, Pistol Amy said, we demand truth and justice for Abby and Libby. May the persistent people combing through this case bring it all to light. Yeah, 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 exactly. Okay, so Ron Logan died of COVID in January of 2022. So my argument would be, if he is involved... Why would the defense not go for that angle unless he, because sometimes he had like hunters staying at his properties from what I've heard, okay, from what I've heard from locals, 
he had hunters or, you know, people staying on his property. So I don't know. What if he had the Odinus staying in his properties or something? I have no idea. I don't know where they're getting the horses that they're supposedly sacrificing. Ugh, there was another case that we looked at recently as well where people did the same thing for Odin. Oh my goodness. It's just weird. You just never know, you know? <laughs> anyway, let's just continue on. So if, if, if he's the guy, like one guy, I think the defense would have gone for that already, right? Yeah, uh, TJ says the legs are different. I also think he's, I think the legs look quite different. Okay, this is now a document summary. We're going to get to that. First, I want to show you this, which is why the conversation is coming up again, in case anyone's wondering, why the hell am I talking about this again? <laughs> like, guess the why are you talking about Ron Logan again? It's from this new CW documentary, which, by the way, is not available outside of America, even with a VPN. No. Just can't watch it. So thank you so much to everyone who sent me clips and things. I'm actually featured <laughs> in the documentary in two places. Hope I made you proud because I literally said one of the clips that they put in was um, that I said, and we call him Little Dicky. <laughs> I'm like, they actually put that in? Little Dicky? Oh my goodness. <laughs> Auntie Lynn, you said my anniversary date and thank you for being a member for 26 months. Okay, let's quickly listen to this clip. Maybe I should just boost it. Hold on one second. Let's quickly put the boost on, just in case, just in case. Okay, so, and let's make it full screen again for you. Ah, come on, work with me, computer. I do actually want to show you something else after this, so hold on. Okay, here we go. Have you seen this clip, by the way? Have you seen it? Here we go. I remember him from the Inside Edition. Liberty German shot this chilling image of the killer approaching the girls on a hiking trail, and she recorded the killer's voice. What do you hear on there? Nothing that I recognize at all. N no one. I, I don't. Uh, I don't recognize the voice at all. Wow. That's okay, so that's Connie, Ron Logan's ex-girlfriend, right? And she has not been interviewed by News Nation, and she says, that guy on the bridge is Ron Logan. You know who else says it? Another ex-girlfriend that's part of the search warrant, because I had to look, wait, 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 is that the same ex-girlfriend from the search warrant of Ron Logan's property from March? No, that was a different one. And then his cousin also thought it was him. So that's three people who saw bridge guy and thought it was him and called it into the tip line, which is pretty interesting, right? Um, Luke Kiva says the guy on the left doesn't look like the type of guy to accessorize his closet with different color bomber jackets <laughs> to match his other outfits. Looks like a one drab olive bomber jacket kind of guy. Right? Okay. So, check this out. That's your voice. And I heard the voice of down the hill. Oh, thousands of times. It's Ron Logan saying down the hill. And I called. I called the tip line. Joining me now, uh, News Nation senior national correspondent Brian Enton. So Connie Dillman seems so confident about this. Like, what else makes her think that it's her ex-boyfriend who's the killer? Yeah, this was a big moment tonight, Ashley. We've never heard from Connie Dillman before. This is all brand new. Now, when they say that, <laughs> you know, we followed Brian Enton since the Gabby Petito days, right? When they say on News Nation, this is the very first time we've heard about Connie, brand new information. It's really not. It's really not. R&M Productions have a video out from a year ago where Connie says even more. And that's what we're going to watch together in the members only stream right after this. I can't uh, show the whole thing right now, but I will link it in the description box. Okay, but just listen to this. Um, so this is this is uh, something we've never, never heard before. And let's also not forget in all this that Ron Logan is dead, by the way, for people who are following along. He died of COVID. Um, but she basically says that he is a bad man, that he is a violent man, that she thinks that he did it, that he was violent with her in the past. And, and as you heard in that clip, that when he when she heard that voice, she thought right away that it was Ron Logan. Uh, listen to a little more of what she said for the first time tonight uh, about. <laughs> for the first time tonight, okay? <laughs> I just had, oh, sorry, I'm so sorry for giggling at that, but it isn't the first time. I can show you this. Wait for it. Right here is this R&M Productions video. Wait, I should have shown you the date. From one year ago, published October 14th. What? I published October 14th of 2022. That's even more. That's a year and a half ago, okay? We're going to watch more of that clip now. I just want to show you 
RNA Productions look. Oh yeah, yeah. that you yeah. learned about the murders. You remember kind of. Oh yeah, I remember, I remember the very day when I heard that two girls had been murdered on his property. It's like, oh my god, he finally killed somebody. This is an epic interview, and here's RNM Productions. Thank you for being here. We're gonna look at this whole thing together. It is like the amount of information that Connie shares over here, the ex-girlfriend that News Nation says is the first time that anyone's ever hearing from her. No, 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 no. <laughs> no, RNM Productions, you know what I mean? But I know they don't really like to give YouTubers any credit, you know what I mean? Um, so, RNM Productions said she did. She tipped him in, the FBI interviewed her on the weekend of March 3rd. Yeah, so for people asking, um, because they also talked about Connie on Nancy Grace. Which, by the way, I was really shocked because I know <laughs> some people like Nancy Grace, others don't. Okay, I'm not here to get like, I don't know what. I like her, okay? But I know some people like, I don't know, triggered or something. The point is, I like how she's like a straight shooter. She's pretty snarky, <laughs> right? However, I can't believe that Nancy Grace said that they actually exhumed a cat from Richard Allen's backyard and found hair that matched the victim. That is a straight up lie. So like, you know how, okay, I'm not trying to start a war <laughs> with mainstream media, but you know how mainstream media is always pointing the finger at YouTubers, but like, hello, could you get your information right? You know? Come on, man. You can't say that. You can't say that they exhumed a cat. That was a rumor, a pure rumor. My goodness. Okay, so anyway, let's listen to this some more. Listen, now you've seen Connie actually spoke to r and Productions and maybe even more people way back. Okay, it's not brand new, but let's listen to what Connie says because it's very interesting. Okay, where'd the sound go? Now the sound is being naughty. About what kind of man this is. Ron's property. He had some pasture. He had some goats and the horses. I moved in with him for a while and it, it didn't really work out very well. He was controlling with me. I had to keep the house tidy and couldn't lay down on the couch. It just had to be the way he wanted it. But he wanted me there. It, it goes a little bit further than um, me in his life. He's I'm pretty much a sex tool. Oh my goodness, she's like literally reliving the trauma. Now, what I do want to say is if Ron Logan was a abuser, if he was a total asshole, if he was violent, if he was all these things, right? Because I'm not discounting anything that Connie is saying. He might have been and still not be the killer of Abby and Libby. Those are possible scenarios because sometimes people get a little bit tunnel vision and say, oh my goodness, like Ron Logan was so violent and it was on his property. That said, he's the killer. It might not be though. There's many terrible people that could live in one space, unfortunately, as we know, right? Uh, Pamela, my goodness, thank you so much for a $50 super sticker. My word, thank you very, very much. I really appreciate it. Okay, <laughs> Honey Cycle's like, BG's not an old man. <laughs> and the sketches are not really Ron Logan or Richard Allen or anyone we've seen, are they? Weird case this, I must say. This case, wow, what the weirdest case of all time. And I already said that, like, Five years ago to myself before I was even on YouTube I'm like damn this case is weird <laughs> um people were saying I should make a podcast episode about it way back then when I was just a podcaster right I didn't have a YouTube channel yet and yeah I was just like I don't know man this case is so weird but it got even weirder sometimes I still get like the chills thinking I'm, I'm sitting here reporting on it because it's even weirder wow Amanda thank you so much okay yeah yeah we can start okay, okay. Yeah. That music could be a problem for me, so I'm gonna go forward because you know how YouTube goes. What I don't like is when she says, Can we stop? and then she gets off the camera and then they don't stop <laughs> playing the sound. Shame. I'd be like, Absolutely, and cut that out, right? Right? Anyway. <laughs> Right. 
when I didn't want to have sex. He forced it on me. And I was helpless. You know, I, I couldn't help myself. And I should have said trigger warning. This is about domestic violence, as you can hear. I mean, damn, he hit her over the head with a wrench. And she drove away and blood was gushing down her face. I mean, if if, if that's true, it's very very hectic and yeah i've heard some things along the way about ron logan but again he's no longer alive to tell his side of the story which is a little bit unfair right <laughs> yeah stefan instead of like making it stop just add cue the dramatic music exactly um so constant says why didn't she reach out to news outlets before i don't think it's her job to reach out to news outlets but she reached out to the fbi and the police so she did the right thing she did call in the tip also someone earlier said it uh, looks nothing like the sketches, though, but neither does R.A., in my opinion, right? And R&M Production said, Connie is the coolest. She was married to a wonderful man for 25 years. He died seven years ago. She lives on a big, beautiful piece of land with horses, dogs, wildflowers. She's a strong, lovely lady. That is great. That is right. Okay. Who needs to back up? You're like, we need to back up. Gee, what are we backing up to? No sound? Okay, wait. Let's go back. Stand by. When I did get away, he would always draw me back one day. He had been working on um, putting a new door on the a basement cellar, and I said, I wanted to break. I want to go back a little because I see you guys say it was muted. It wasn't muted on my side, but I want to play it all for you. <sighs> When I didn't want to have sex, he forced it on me. And I was helpless. You know, I, I couldn't help myself. And when I did get away, he would always draw me back. One day, he had been working on um, putting a new door on the basement cellar. And I said, I wanted to break it off with him. And out of the blue, he hit me over the head with the crescent wrench. And I remember taking off, running to my vehicle, and I remember falling to the ground. And I was afraid he was going to hit me again. So. Sure. I'm just going to pause for a second there. Also because of the music, as you know, YouTube, they could shut this whole stream down because of the music they're playing there that I don't have the rights to. So I'm just going to be careful, okay? Sorry for interrupting. Mary says, about DNA, if found, uh, if any found on the girls and these nails, etc. to exclude or include suspects. Yeah, one would think, right? But they did say that, along the way, they said they do have DNA, but Richard Allen is not linked. They don't have his DNA. That's so weird. Oh, there's so much <laughs> that I could say about this case. There's so much, right? Okay, so let's just finish this clip here. Thank you so much, Mary, for your sticker. I was able to get on my hands and knees and I crawled away. I got to my vehicle and I was able to, to leave and then I felt the blood running down my face. I barely remember the drive to the doctor's office, which is only a few miles to Delphi and had um, seven steeples put in my head. But uh, I actually went to my sister's after that. I'm lucky I got out of that situation, but it took a long time. It really is stunning to hear her tell that story for the first time. She's obviously very, very emotional. And again, she feels confident, Connie does, uh, that the wrong guy may be locked up, which is which is pretty startling to think about. Not only that. If true, that is startling to think about, right? If true. <laughs> if they don't have the right guy locked up, startling to think about. One would hope they do and that he gets a fair trial. My fight has been that I hope he gets a fair trial. Freaking Judge Gall is still pulling the same stunts. When we look at all the documents again, we still see it's the same. It's the same thing going on. You know, the defense asking for something, her saying, nope. McLean asking for something, yep. Like all kinds of things. They can't even have their cell phones or electronics or anything at the next hearing. It's just like, my goodness. Okay, I'm going to link that clip for you if you want to watch the last minute of it or so. Um, it would be Brian Enton and Ashley Banfield discussing a few things there. Okay, for about a minute. But as I say, on R&M Productions, which I'm going to show to the members, by the way, R&M Productions, I've just got to show it to them and offer some commentary as we watch it and say, oh my word, can you believe this? Because she says a lot of things in that interview that's uh, quite hectic. I will, I will link it for you in the description box afterwards as well, okay?
So if anyone's not joining the member stream, never feel obliged. Don't worry, it's got to be linked for you. Go watch it if you've never seen it before. Or you could just Google RM Productions, the Delphi Murders, Monster on the Monon. Now, somebody was saying, how do we know that that's true? You know what that lady's saying? Well, we don't. Firstly, we don't. <laughs> to me, it seems very believable, very convincing. But no, we don't know that it's true. However, in the Ron Logan search warrant, the FBI had mentioned their reasons, you know, for drawing up the search warrant. And one of them was about an ex-girlfriend saying that he was violent and all the same things that Connie said. That wasn't Connie that they were talking about. Connie dated him for about six years. The lady they mentioned in the search warrant only dated him for a few months. And he'd also dated many, okay, Jeannie, Connie, um, the cousin had also said that that was him on the bridge, Phyllis, Ashley, all kinds, right? And in that clip from r and Productions, uh, Connie actually says from a year and a half ago, that Ron Logan, I mean, he, he could be a complete weirdo, a weirdo, right? Apparently, he used to, like, watch animals mating and really get off on that. That's really weird. I can't believe I just said all those words. What? So that's weird because at the crime scene, you know, for um, of Abby and Libby, they said they found um, unknown fibers and they were looking into, you know, animal hair, which is where the cat rumor comes from. All of that, right? So that... Um, and then, let me not lose my train of thought because these rabbit holes are very deep. <laughs> Connie had also, so she said he was violent, so did the other girlfriend, right? Many of them have said this. So even if he was violent, even if he was a weirdo, even if he, I don't know, I don't know about the animals and all that, it's still, he could be a weirdo and the murders could have happened on his property and he could still not be linked. But as Joe Jackalone says, he doesn't believe in coincidences. <laughs> Uh, Kirsten says, I just want to hear facts. Well, then you've got to wait for October 15th of 2024 when it's the trial. You know, we'd all have to stay silent and not have any discussions if we only want facts. You know why? Because facts are on the document. Sure, sure, many. <laughs> Unless people start talking about the Frank's memorandum, which is all about the Odinists. Then they're like, no, 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 no. That's a theory. I don't know. The point is, um, if you want facts, October 15th, 2024, the trial should be kicking, kicking off and hopefully one will hear facts there. One would hope so, right? Serenity, welcome. Um, Jackie says five tipsters tipped in Logan, not one has tipped in Alan before since he actually 13 tipped in Logan in the early days. So that's interesting. It's interesting that two girlfriends and a cousin say that when they saw Bridge Guy, they thought that was Ron Logan. When they heard the voice, they thought it was him. You know, it's all interesting, but we can do nothing with it right now. We can only speculate, talk about it, that's what we can do. So what I'm going to do now is let's go to the documents and let's see what's happened in the last few weeks. Um, Connie also said in that RNM Productions interview that Ron Logan always carried a gun with him and always carried a knife with him. So that's also interesting. <laughs> but do we know that Richard Allen always carried a gun with him and always a knife? No, we don't. We know that the girls were killed with a sharp weapon, not a gun. We also know, uh, according to Barbara MacDonald, that the unspent round was not collected when the crime scene was first secured, but only later. Wow. Okay. You know what's also interesting is that many people very close to the investigation. So people that you've seen, that live there, that are local, that have maybe been on court TV, all that kind of stuff. Okay. They all think, from what I'm gathering, that Ron Logan is bridge guy. <laughs> So that's a lot of people that think Ron Logan is Bridge Guy. It's very interesting. I don't know. I don't know what I think. I'm just observing. Okay, so let's quickly go to the document summary. I'm just going to go forward a little bit. We've done our recap. We looked at the POIs in the past, of which, again, I say, look how many people could be persons of interest. All incredibly scary. In fact, Richard Allen is the least scary of all of them. <laughs> like, if you look, I mean, look at... And I'm not just judging on looks, we've gone over this before. So if you've missed, you know, these presentations where we looked at all these POIs and things that they've done, go and check it out. It's on the playlist somewhere there, right? Okay. So, Beetwood Banana, welcome to Grizzly Supporter. So, Ron Logan, there you go. Now, Delphi Documents Summary, since February 7th of 2024. This is just a little summary, right? Um... Yes, RNA Productions, please do to grizzlytruecrime at gmail.com. Oh, thank you so much. Now, Delphi document summary. Okay, a hearing that was set for February 12th of 2024 was postponed to March 18th. So the next big thing on our calendar, the things we need to know is March 18th. 
big hearing in Delphi. Okay, by the request of the defense, they asked it to be delayed to, to then uh, due to additional charges. Remember, McClelland gave Richard Allen a whole bunch of new charges, including not just uh, like the kidnapping related to the murder, but actually murder charges. We looked at that before. And voluminous discovery that they have to work through to prepare for it. So the defense then filed a motion to have all of Richard Allen's charges dismissed because they say that the state destroyed exculpatory evidence, which is in reference to the Odinous video interviews being lost or recorded over. That was all up to February 20th of 2017. Now that in itself is another weird thing that happened in this case, that these Odinist guys were interviewed in the very beginning stages of the investigation, and I mean within days. <laughs> so we're talking like February 17th, like within three days? Within three to six days, they're interviewing these Odinist dudes? That's so weird. Why? Why? What did they have to do with it? Interesting. Um, anyway, so maybe everything, maybe nothing, who knows? But the point is, they interviewed them, there were video recordings like full police interrogations that we like to watch, okay? And they then recorded over them or lost them. So, of course, the defense is saying, well, that's exculpatory evidence. And McLean is saying, no, it isn't, <laughs> which we'll get to. Also, the state tried to, um, they say, the state tried to hide the identity of a key witness, which was Professor Jeffrey Turcott and the Todd Click letter. If you don't know what those are, you've got to check out the playlist because we've gone down those rabbit holes before. McClelland is going on about the defense's contemptuous conduct, which the defense wants clarification on, and they say they did not do anything willfully. So even if there was the leak and all the things that they're accused of, they say they didn't do it willfully. Some things happened in error, like Andrew Baldwin sending an email to the wrong person by mistake, and then someone that they trusted taking photos of what was on the table or on a computer and sharing it, right? Uh, conclusion. We like conclusions with documents, right? And I've done this summary for you because, as I say, it's pages and pages and pages of repetition and fights and punches and counterpunches between still the state, the defense, Judge Gall, all of that. So the conclusion says, for the foregoing reasons, uh, Messrs. Baldwin and Rosie respectfully request the court summarily deny the state's verified information for contemptuous conduct, which, of course, they didn't get anywhere with that. So... Uh, Stephanie, probably, is it's your 13-month grizzly anniversary. You said 13, my lucky number. My birthday is November 13th. Thanks a lot, Brian Koberger. Sorry about that. But thank you so much. Now, the, the, there's another one here, a little snippet, okay? Defense's counsel's petition for clarification regarding contempt hearing filed by attorney Hennessy. So Hennessy, cool dude. Apparently one of the most, I don't know, powerful, well-known attorneys in the in the land. <laughs> He's back on the case. It's like bringing the big guns. Okay, so he's back helping them out. And they say defense's counsel's petition for clarification regarding contempt hearing. So they want to know, what is this all about? Or are you going to catch us by surprise again? Are there going to be cameras and you're going to fire us all over again like you did last time or what? Tell us, what is it we need to prepare? What are we bringing this time? They're not going to be shot in the same movie twice. The court has scheduled a hearing on the state's pleading and therefore denies the petition without hearing. So you see, they ask for clarification. <laughs> Denied. Anything the defense asked for, deny. Moving on, it's just like same old, same old, right? The defense is still waiting to receive transcripts requested from June and November of 2022. That I find weird. And remember that Judge Gold didn't want to give transcripts from their firing day, which I think was October 19th, right? Until the Supreme Court of Indiana stepped in and said, hey, you will give those transcripts over. Then they did. Then we got to see them and read them. Okay. Hence, Maid's Tale says Rick lost weight because he was busted and couldn't go to the pub anymore. I was going to say, if he was a heavy drinker, which he... You know what's odd about R Richard Allen? Is that they say he checked himself into a rehab, like, right after the murders. I mean, that is a little odd. There's many odd things <laughs> in this case. As I say, there's many puzzle pieces, and they're just not fitting yet. So, and we can't make them fit either. We just got to wait. We don't have enough information, I think, to make in informed... Uh, opinions yet we have little bits you know so okay the defense says that they've received lots of discovery since being reinstated and they do not believe that they've seen it all before or they've never had a chance to review all of it the defense has asked to have until march 25th of 2024 to provide the state of indiana with its witness and exhibit list the state says that they provided 26 terabytes that's a lot okay of information to the defense McLean filed a motion to deny their request to delay the deadline. 
He's like, nope, nope, time's up, give in your stuff. So then they said um, that on the right is uh, Bradley Rosie, one of the defense attorneys that was reinstated. The volume of discovery is massive, including minimally 20 hard drives, as well as six separate e-discovery emails. And as of the date of filing, the defense has had less than three weeks to review this discovery. Can you imagine <laughs> going through all that? I mean, I'm like, oh my word, I have to go through like 20 documents. <laughs> it feels a lot, okay? Imagine going through 26 terabytes. Holy crap. And what is all, what all is on there? Like, can you imagine being these attorneys and having all that information? Oh my goodness. So they said, in terms of the state's request for the defense to provide a witness and exhibit list, the defense would seek an extension of time to file its preliminary witness and exhibit list until Monday, March 25th. This will hopefully provide the defense enough time to review the massive discovery to determine what witness it may call a trial, including expert witnesses and what exhibits it would expect to introduce. Certainly, the defense wants to accommodate the state's request, especially as it relates to the state's need to react to any expert witnesses that the defense may present at trial. The defense believes that by March 25th of 2024, the defense should have a much better grasp of the discovery it has received and therefore a much better grasp of which fact witnesses and expert witnesses it expects to call and what exhibits it may introduce. It's quite hectic how they like right now already have to submit that. I mean, I guess it's time, but it's like October. I don't know. They're like, right now, submit everything you have. I think they still have a lot to work through, right? Salty, beach girl, Lori, welcome. Uh, keep grinding up, says lots of those files are massively dense photo or video that can cover hundreds of gigabytes with these. <laughs> I can only imagine. Sure. Imagine going through all of that. So much, so much work. Uh, the defense believes that by March 25th, the defense should have a much better grasp of the discovery it's received and therefore a much better grasp of which fact witness, expert witnesses expects, right? Then they say, defendant's counsel motion for summary denial of the state's verified information for contemptuous conduct reviewed and denied without hearing. Okay, moving on. Then they had another request. So they put in a request, denied. Put in a request, denied. This is another one. A request to allow electronic devices at a hearing. At the hearing. Comes now David R. Hennessy, attorney of record under a limited appearance, and respectfully requests the court's approval to have, uh, for him to have his laptop and cell phone with him in the hearing on March 18th of 2024. The laptop contains documents and information to be used during the hearing. The cell phone will only be used outside uh, the well, the well, <laughs> if counsel needs to contact someone. It'll be turned off at all other times. Wherefore, counsel respectfully prays the court to allow him to bring his laptop and cell phone into the courthouse on March 18th of 2024. That was denied. <laughs> counsel for defense attorney's request to allow electronic devices filed February 15th, reviewed and denied. Without hearing, counsel may contact the court executive for information regarding his request. So, I don't know, are they scared of the deep fakes being recorded? Huh? You know, maybe. <laughs> Phantom's like, at least it's not a gazillion megahertz. <laughs> Thank you all for being here, by the way. Thank you so much. Okay, see, Brenda says, what's up with disrespectful people today? That's what I was saying at the beginning of the episode. If there's anyone here that you feel like is not the usual way for Grizzly True Crime, we've grown quite a bit in the last month or so, so there's lots of new faces. There's like almost 10,000 new faces, okay? They don't quite know how we roll. They'll learn, okay? Trust the mods. We're going to remind them. We keep it grizzly over here. We do not victim blame or shame. We're not ugly to each other or others. We keep it kind and respectful, okay? As much as possible. We snark where appropriate, but not at each other, okay? So, yeah, you see, Lissandra says, isn't this judicial misconduct? Well, <laughs> well, we've been down that road before, right? Sure, with that, uh, the Supreme Court of Indiana. I can't believe that they're just like, judge girl stays. Okay, then. Well, let's see how this goes, right? Yeah, I've actually read that. r and Production says Judge Gold has been known to smash attorney's cell phones. Lol, I wish I were joking. That's a scary thing. So here it's like, no cell phones or laptops allowed. Okay. I'm not sure. What did they, they want it for? Documents and information to be used during the hearing. They're like, not happening. Then, this other little document. And thank you so much to Grizzly Cat and MB Inc. Uh, for helping me find all these documents. Okay. They definitely help a lot, especially when I was so busy with that trial and everything. It's been hard to like also get the documents, put in my request and everything. So they help a lot. So thank you so much, Grizzly Cat and MB Inc. So list of witnesses and exhibits for contempt hearing. Comes now, counsel for attorneys Baldwin and Rosie and provides the following. Now, I don't know who half these people are, but it sounds interesting. If you know, let me know. Okay. Um, witnesses. 
Joe Morris, Andrew Matronowski, Kay Beeler, Mark, I'm sure that's Thomas, right? Or is it Toma? And John Boren. Exhibits. Affidavits of the following. Thomas Leatherman, Stacey Uliana, Ashley Schultz, David Pumphrey, Andy Matanowski, James Fry, Lisa Johnson, Joel Weinecker, and Gojko Kasik. The Indiana Public Defenders Council performance guidelines for criminal defense representation, witnesses, and exhibits will be supplemented as they become known. So, the state filed a motion to demand that the, the defense turn over all witness and exhibit info for the hearing on March 18th by March 7th. <laughs> so again, you know, it's kind of like, it just seems so petty sometimes, just from the outside looking in. It seems like Judge Gall is biased, like she has a favorite, like she lets McClelland have anything he wants, anything he requests and get he gets it. Anything the defense asks, nope, nope, definitely not, not happening, denied, without hearing. Like, don't want to hear it, talk to the hand. So here as well, appearance, this was another document, under Indiana trial rules 3.1a and 3.1i, the undersigned gives notice of his limited appearance for Andrew Baldwin and Bradley Rosie, counsel for the defendant in this case. Interesting. Name of parties represented, Andrew Baldwin and Bradley Rosie. Attorney information as applicable for service is Michael K. Ausbrook. Ausbrook? How would you say it in America? Ausbrook. It sounds quite German. <laughs> anyway, Indiana University Morris School of Law. Don't know who that dude is, but he's going to be there, right? <laughs> Thank you so much, Miss Holmes. I really appreciate it. Lots of new faces here. Always nice to see a, a growing grizzly community. So those that's a summary of the documents from, like, as I say, there's like 20. There's actually like 39 documents. I think there's 39 when I counted, right? Mary says, uh, question, has the family expressed thoughts over all that's going on? No, nope, they can't because of the gag order. So the, no, they have not. Unfortunately, there is a gag order. Maybe it's good. Maybe they should keep things close to the best with how wild things go. I don't know. It just, uh, <laughs> yeah. So let me quickly get these other, there's two more documents I do want to show you. And I do want to just remind you of a few things from the search warrant from Ron Logan's property. Because it's interesting, in case you forgot about it. Okay. <laughs> so now, if you don't know anything about this case, I hope you'll look at the description box. There's a little write-up there for you. And there's also a playlist that's linked for you, as well as a case file is something I call it when I put together all the chronological, you know, press conferences, interviews, and all that. So if you've never seen the case file I made for you, go and check it out, right? Okay, I'm just checking here what you say. Uh, Jackie Johnson, no Logan talk without RM. They likely the only reason CW hit that out. Okay, thank you all for sharing your opinions. I'm looking forward to read your comments as well. Please leave your comments below after this live stream too. And remember, this is a live stream, so if you feel like, I don't know, I don't know, snarky or something, just look at the timestamps to skip to where you want to go to, okay? So, Lissa says, Alan could have gone with Logan Defense in the first place, in my opinion. Yeah, that's what I'm also thinking. Why did they not? If it's so obvious, why did they not? Or is it because the defense is like, no one will believe us because the guy's dead? Or is there a rule about that? I have no idea. <laughs> right? Um, Andrea says, have I looked into the other guys in the pic? Yes. Um, I did. It's on my playlist. Okay, so now this is one final document as part of this huge pile of documents. And it's just, again, the tone that uh, the prosecutor, Nicholas McClellan, takes, which I believe his term ends in 2026 or something he said. Okay, so uh, G.A. Perkins, exactly. There was no cat here found. That's not true, just a rumor. Exactly. That's what I'm saying. I just can't believe that mainstream media reports it as fact. Like, <laughs> wow. Okay, so stand by. One more. And then we're going to read this document. Tony. Oh, my goodness. Thank you so much. He said, being a grizzly is a privilege. We work with, uh, we, we work for. G says the rules, which we follow. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. Respect for each other and empathy for the victims and their families are the utmost priority. Absolutely. Thank you so much. This is why we love G. Thank you. So this is State of Indiana versus Richard M. Allen, okay? One of the latest documents filed on the 22nd of February, today is the 25th. State's response to the defendant's motion to dismiss for destroying exculpatory evidence. So it seems like they are like, uh, you know, a little bit upset now <laughs> that they said that the state has destroyed exculpatory evidence by losing all that video footage. So now there's a comeback, right? There's a clapback. I'm just using layman's terms because I'm not a lawyer and that's how I'm reading it, right? This is what I'm seeing happening. RNM Productions, welcome. So they say, now comes the state of Indiana by prosecuting attorney Nicholas C. McLean and respectfully objects to the defendant's motion to dismiss for destroying exculpatory evidence. 
the evidence in question is not exculpatory evidence, nor is it potentially useful evidence. The interviews of PW and BH are not evidence at all related to this case. Well, <laughs> that's weird. You know what I mean? Like, if it's not at all, like, how do you know? <laughs> I mean, maybe they know. I'm just saying, like, it's to so confidently be like, it's not at all anything to do with it. Who cares if we lost that? Well, it does matter. You interviewed those guys immediately. You were, like, immediately on to Ron Logan and those guys. Is that a group? I don't know. Is there more than one involved? That's kind of what Doug Carter has always said, right? So to just be like, no, that's not exculpatory. There are simply interviews that the defense wish to use to purport, uh, sorry, support a wild theory of this case that has no evidentiary support whatsoever. Well, there's other FBI agents and police officers who disagreed and did a long investigation, and I think two of the three or so died. One was killed, literally shot, assassinated, basically. So that's pretty weird. Lots of weird deaths in this case as well, huh? Anyway. So then they say, however, even though the interviews were not evidence, they were not destroyed by the state purposefully or in bad faith. Oh, just like the same way that the defense didn't then purposefully or willfully leak information. <laughs> and there's been leaks all along the way, I'm just saying. I'm not trying to stand up for them. That was wrong. The stuff leaking out was terrible. Can't imagine how the families felt when those photos and things went around and all the hype about it. But you see what I'm saying? You speak in the same language <laughs> as the defense. So, uh, yeah, same, same, but different, right? For those reasons, the state would ask the court to deny the motion and in support thereof states the following. That on August 10th of 2017, Carroll County Prosecutor's Office investigator Steve Mullen discovered that the DVR at the Delphi Police Department for the interview room had been recording continuously for an unknown number of days. Mullen determined that the data storage on the six terabyte drive had been consumed causing the equipment to record over previous recordings, resulting in lost data. Okay, but then why don't you interview them again? Do it again, or not? Or was it not important? I don't know. Why did the investigation continue then? I wish I could see this 85-page Odin report and all that kind of thing. I know some people still think it's like crazy talk to say Odin, but it's like, it's really, it's a thing. Okay, I'm not going to go down that road again. So, it's not just a conspiracy. It exists. Okay. Moving on. Causing the equipment to record. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, the representative advised that all recordings prior to February 20th, 17, 2017 were lost. That on February 17th of 2017, I mean, that's three days after the bodies were found? Why? <laughs> Maybe we're just curious. Why? Three days later. And McLennan goes to one of the same Masonic lodges as one of these dudes. That's just weird. One of the first dudes they mentioned there. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> wow. Okay, so on February 17th, they interviewed that guy, the Odinist dude, at the Delphi Police Department. This recorded interview was lost due to the DVR recording over as described in paragraph one. The narrative summary prepared by investigators from that interview has been provided to the defense. That on February 19th, investigators interviewed the other guy, PW, who says that they don't sacrifice little girls, they sacrifice horses. And I'm like, that doesn't sound great either, dude. He was interviewed on... What is it? I don't know. I don't know. If I find it, I'll link it for you, okay? The PW guy. At his home, and a narrative report has been provided to the defense. The report does not indicate that the interview was recorded and no recording has been located in the state's position. Why not? <laughs> Why? Like, don't they are, they... are they not very thorough? I don't understand. Even like when that Dan Dillon guy spoke to Richard Allen. Why is there no body cam? Why is there no paperwork? Why is there no evidence of that? Oh, goodness, okay. Complacency is a killer, I always say. That the defense suggests that the state destroyed these recordings, which they believe to be evidence that is, is, is exculpatory in nature, further claiming that the loss of the recordings was negligent or purposeful on the part of the state. That the interviews of BH and PW are neither exculpatory nor are they potentially useful evidence. That the state did not destroy any recordings maliciously or in bad faith. And so they go on. They give examples. They say that the defense is merely speculating that the interviews that were recorded over will aid the defense. Well, you know? Yeah, Tiff Knox says, summary doesn't equal whole interviews. I mean, the summary, and the summary is part of the discoveries. <laughs> Obviously, the defense would be like, well, damn. Initially, you really interviewed these guys and some other FBI agents went on to, to keep on looking at that angle, you know, of the Odinist thing. 
they're just like, no, that video is gone. Very interesting. Very interesting. Welcome, Daisy Love. The loss of recordings does not justify application of the two-part test to see if the loss warrants dismissal. And so they go on to just explain that it's not important, right? So it's a six-page document, as you can see. And um, wherefore, the state objects to the defendant's motion to dismiss for destruction of exculpatory evidence and would ask the court to deny the same, respectfully submitted. <laughs> so those are the latest documents. Now, I've highlighted a few things from the Ron Logan search warrant, which was initially leaked by the Murder Sheet podcast, if you forgot. There's been leaks all over the place. <laughs> from the beginning. None as bad as crime scene photos, I understand. But still, damn. Um, Kim Kelly says, following this case is like herding a bunch of cats on horseback. It goes every which way. It really does. That's a good way to put it, right? Ju T said to think what the families are going through and have been going through for years now and how this case just keeps getting more twisted. My heart breaks for them. Right? I can't imagine how they feel. It's just like, it must feel so... I don't know. Like, they must feel so hopeless at this point. I hope they don't. I hope they're still keeping their hope alive that there will be justice for Abby and Libby. But it must be difficult right now with how things are going. Right? Okay. So... Salty beach girl Lori says they agree it was wrong. They were horrified. Now, this is the search warrant executed at Ron Logan's property. The same property where the girls' bodies were found. Okay? So, this is an FBI agent writing this, Nicole Robertson, special agent with the FBI. Background. They said on February 13th of 2017 at approximately 1 p.m., juvenile victims hereafter referred to as LG and AW were taken to the Monon High Bridge Trail located in Delphi, Indiana. Right? So they say here, I'm, I'm just going to the highlights. We've looked at this before. We've gone over the whole thing. It's on the playlist. I just want to remind you of some interesting things, right? Approximately 5.30 p.m. was the last successful ping of the cellular phone by AT&T. So some of the strange things in this case, I know I'm not helping give you facts because I'm not here to give facts. We're here to discuss the case, right? <laughs> we don't know the facts until the trial. At this point, it's just interesting to revisit things like that when they say the phone, the last successful ping was at 5.30 p.m. It's also interesting that Libby's phone was found under one of the bodies, right? According to what the defense put out there in the Frank's memorandum. And I don't know if you remember, and maybe he just misspoke, but... Um, Mike Patty had said that Libby's phone was like pinging all over town that night. All of that is so weird. I recently also saw that they, they initially had a search warrant at some random little church in the area. That's so strange. There's so many things we don't know about. You know what I mean? Okay. So the last successful ping. Then we know that the development of the suspect was made by a 43 second video taken on LG's phone. We've only seen a second. Okay. One second. There's 43 seconds which they keeping to themselves, where the suspect follows the victims as they are walking on the Monon High Bridge Trail. Near the end of the video, the suspect speaks to the victims, saying, down the hill. It sounds as though he's directing the victims to leave the trail that they were on and enter the wooded area below. No person has come forward and identified himself as the person who met the victims and made the statement in LG's video. Therefore, it's believed that the person in LG's video participated in the killings. So they say, because no one came forward, they now believe that that person was involved in the killings. Was involved in. I just find the language interesting. I've always thought it's more than one person, but it could be a lone wolf situation. It could very well be. You know? But my gut feel says it could be more <laughs> than one person. So, especially with our Doug Carter talks as well. It was always very interesting. They said images of the suspect have been broadcast in the news media since February 15th, 2017 as a person of interest. Then they said on February 14th at approximately 12.17 p.m., victims LG and AW were found dead with wounds caused by a sharp weapon on the property owned by Ronald Logan. A large amount of blood was lost by the victims at the crime scene, which is very different to what people are saying that have actually seen the photos. They're saying... There wasn't a large amount of blood at the scene. That they're speculating, many of them that have apparently seen the photo say they must have been killed elsewhere. Or someone close by and dragged, or I don't know. Now, what Connie said in the interview from uh, RNM Productions, which you're going to watch as a member stream right after this, she said that Ron Logan would go out and shoot deer, bring the deer back home, 
and you know um like how do i word it <laughs> not a hunter so i don't know the word right now do things to package it or whatever in in the barn so that the blood would go on the soil and then it could just clear out the soil so that was interesting as well to hear that anyway so they said a large amount of blood, blood was lost by the victims at the crime scene because of the nature of the victim's wounds, it's, cert it's nearly certain that the perpetrator of the crime would have gotten blood on his personal clothing. The location of the crime scene is approximately 1,400 feet from Logan's residence, right? Okay, so they say Logan is a 77-year-old male. His physical build is consistent with that of the male suspect videoed by LG on the Monon High Bridge Trail. Logan owns farmland and cares for large farm animals. He appears to be in good physical condition. He's been interviewed several times. His voice is not inconsistent with that other person in the video. Which you see, when Connie comes forward to say it, well, the FBI also said it's not inconsistent with the voice. They thought it looked like him. You know? So I'm basically just trying to validate what Connie said as well. There's some merit to it. But he might not be involved at all. And he's also dead now. So it was discovered that uh, one of the victims, something was missing from one of the victims from the crime scene while the rest of their clothing was recovered. It also appeared the girls' bodies were moved and staged. So that's still consistent. They're still saying that, right? Based upon my training and experience, it's common for perpetrators of this type of crime to take a souvenir or in some fashion memorialize the crime scene, whether by photos or, or electronic or digital methods that are then downloaded onto computers. I know we all still wonder if that's part of a group share of something. Is Ken Klein part of that? I don't know. Him and his dad, they were part of some weird stuff. Maybe still are. Who knows? Um, so there's that as well. But while they've said that there's no, and it's just something that, that's kind of floating out there, that Richard Allen, there's no digital data linking him to the victims. Well, I wonder if they found anything, because we don't know what all they found in the search warrant of Richard Allen's house. How do we know that they didn't find trophies or Polaroids or necklaces or underwear? Or we don't know. <laughs> So it must be hard, right, with this gag order, with everyone biting their tongue. Oh my goodness. All right, so then to go, I'm not going to read the whole thing again because it's pretty long. Highlights, I'm trying to stick to my highlights, okay? So they say, during the processing of the crime scene, investigators located unknown fibers and unidentified hairs, which doesn't then mean Richard Allen's cat got exhumed and it matched. There's no such thing. That's just pure rumor. It's gossip. It's not a fact, okay? So unknown fibers and unidentified hairs which made everyone wonder about like animal hairs or what the hell and of course it's a farm ron logan's got horses goats sheep rabbits so yes that's interesting but you never know if the killer or killers were trying to frame ron logan either how do we not know that <laughs> what if it's people that thought he's got a big property people are going to definitely think it's him because of his violent past because of everything his girlfriends will say about him how do we know Kiwi says, exactly, gee, I'm curious as to what they found in his house, right? Now, here they said Logan owns numerous weapons, including handguns and knives that were observed by law enforcement officers during the execution of a search warrant that took place at his home on March 6th of 2017. So, yes, it was a month or so later. That's quite some time to get rid of evidence if there ever was any of what they were looking for, like blood or I don't know what, right? Logan's home was searched as a result of a probation violation. The search was limited to the discovery of firearms. The search was limited to the discovery of firearms because it's been going around for a little bit that they didn't mention firearms. If, if this unspent round was so important, why didn't they look for it here? But they did. They said the search was limited to the discovery of firearms and included only his main residence. So the unspent round was important then, in my opinion, based on that, right? <laughs> The eye of a puppet. <laughs> you said Logan, it was a horse. Chadwell, it was his dog. And now Ari, it's a cat. None will match. Yeah, and then they say unknown fibers. I wonder what exactly they are talking about there. And unknown means like unknown. How how do we know? We could, we could speculate so many things, right? Okay, so we're going forward. This is that little story of Ron Logan's alibi. So let's just go down a little bit. Wait, maybe I should read it. Maybe I should read it. On February 14th, 2017, at approximately 9.20 a.m., Logan contacted his cousin. So the next morning, he asked the cousin to tell the police that he came to his home between 2 and 2.30 on February 13th to pick up Logan. Logan further told him to say, um, I'm also saying this because they say on this documentary that his alibi didn't check out or that he 
they there's basically like no information about it but the information is right here of exactly how it went right besides the time gap okay there is a time gap there but they know he was on the property then he went there all of that so here they say he told the cousin they came to so he he wants the cousin to say to the police that uh, he he came to Logan's home between two and two thirty on February thirteenth to pick him up. Logan further told the cousin to say that he drove Logan to an aquarium store in Lafayette, Indiana. Logan told this person to say that they returned home to Logan's house between five and five thirty. Very specific with what he wanted him to say. On February fourteenth of twenty seventeen, while requesting consent to search uh, Logan's property. A law enforcement officer advised Logan that law enforcement officers would not search his home unless evidence led them there. Now, what they find strange is that Logan said, I don't think evidence will lead them here, but I don't know. <laughs> but I mean, he might just say that if he's awkward or nervous or something. A receipt from Aquarium World in Lafayette dated February 13th of 2017 with a checkout time of 5.21 p.m. was found in Logan's home on March 6th of 2017 during a probation violation search. Logan resides approximately 22 miles from the store. It would take approximately 30 minutes to get to the store. So if you do a bit of backwards math, I was like, okay. And I always add in buffer time. It's what I do in my personal life too. I'm like, oh, 30 minutes there, 30 minutes back, add in 15 minutes. <laughs> he would have left at around, I think it was like 4 p.m. Which means he could be bridge guy. For everybody, which many people close to the case think he is, he could be. He actually could be because his phone was pinging at his house at 2.09 p.m. And as we know, it's not like at his house. It's like that whole area. You know what I mean? Okay, so. <laughs> Jackie Johnson says, Rick is a good man. No red flags. Are we talking about Rick's name? Are we talking about Delphi After Dark? Okay. Or are you talking about Richard Allen? <laughs> Which Rick are you talking about now? Now, yeah, so let's just say that's so sassy to tell his cousin an alibi. But now they, they go on. I'm just reminding you guys of this in case you forgot and why the conversation still comes up. Because there are some weird things related to Ron Logan. I would say, one could say, well, that's a weird coincidence. That's strange that he lied about this. And obviously he didn't want the police to know that he was driving because he wasn't allowed to. He was also not allowed to have firearms. You know. So that's a probation violation. Maybe that's why he lied. I understand that argument. But it's also, if you look at the other side and you really want to look at him like, what if he is bridge guy? What if he is involved? Well, you could look at it from all sides until we have more evidence, right? So this receipt was there. So for anyone that says there was no receipt, there's no alibi check, well, they do know a little bit about his day. The receipt shows he was there at 521, which means he would have had to leave home around 4 p.m. Some people speculate if it's, you know, um, abducting the girls, taking them, I don't know where, across the creek or to another location, I'll probably probably across the creek to the property and even keeping them locked up in a barn or something somewhere that I don't know. I don't know. And then going off alibi talk to go to the aquarium and come back and then do who knows what. There's so, so many options on the table until we know, right? Okay. So then they say um, on March 6th of 2017, during an interview with a law enforcement officer, Logan said he was picked up by the cousin around 3 p.m. to take it straight to the aquarium store in Lafayette. In the March 6th uh, interview, Logan said that he was done at the aquarium store. He was driven straight home. These statements were found to be factually false and intentionally designed to deceive law enforcement officers, which would be so that he doesn't violate his probation orders, in my opinion. Right? Now, on March 7th, uh, the cousin was interviewed by a law enforcement officer. They told the law enforcement officer that he was with Logan on Monday, February 13th, and that they drove he drove Logan to the aquarium store in Lafayette. On March 9th of 2017, they were interviewed by another law enforcement officer regarding the trip to the aquarium. They told law enforcement uh, that he had lied when he was interviewed at Logan's request. He explained that no Logan had never asked him to lie in the past and that he knows that Logan has driven his vehicle while in probation and whether he was allowed to or not. So the cousin found it weird that on this day he asked him to lie about that one thing and also not to lie about him going to the trash. He went to like a trash site first they came home and then asked the cousin to drive him to the tropical fish place. I think he also went to a bar, didn't he? Isn't that also part of the problem? On March 12th of 2017, the cousin explained in an interview to a law enforcement officer that Logan called him. Now, this is interesting. This one I do find interesting. Okay. Logan called him on the morning of February 14th of 2017 and asked him to provide the alibi for Logan's drive to the aquarium in Lafayette. This phone call was made prior to the discovery of Libby and Abby's deceased bodies. 
So whether he saw it or not and was like, oh crap, they're going to think it's me. I don't know what to do now. And then he called the cousin and said, look, 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 you're going to have to do this because now they're on my property and I don't know. <laughs> well, that's all red flag, right? It's all a red flag. <laughs> Doesn't mean he's the killer, but it's still a red flag. Based on what the ex-girlfriends are saying, that is the one thing I still find very interesting. That he's calling the cousin before the bodies are even discovered and saying, hey, 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 you need to tell the police that like, okay, okay, you took me to the aquarium, okay? Right. So they said, based on investigations, uh, investigators' experience, it is reasonable to believe that the creation of an alibi prior to the discovery of a crime indicates culpability or knowledge of the crime. You know? So they say... Law enforcement officers learned that Logan had driven on February 13th to the transfer station in Delphi, Indiana, to drop off trash. Now, the thing is, he'd apparently broke a girlfriend had broken up with him, I think they said two months before, but he was really mad about it then. And obviously, it's around Valentine's Day and all that. I don't know if it meant anything to him, but the thing is, he was really pissed off about that and went to, like, trash all those stuff, is what I've heard. I'm not sure if that's true or not. Any locals in chat, anyone who's an expert on the case, let me know. But he went there uh, to this transfer station in Delphi, Indiana, to drop off the trash. Video from the transfer station shows him driving his white Ford pickup truck between 11.27 and 11.32 a.m. The video from the transfer station appears to be off by 26 minutes, putting Logan at the transfer station from approximately 11.53 to 11.58. Now, what's interesting, he didn't ask the cousin to provide an alibi for his drive to the transfer station. He only asked the cousin to provide an alibi for a trip that would have occurred at the time of the apparent abduction of Libby and Abby. Interesting. On March 8th, 2017, somebody was interviewed by law enforcement officers. They met Logan about seven or eight years ago. They were in a personal relationship with Logan for a couple of months and would stay with him in his home. See, this is the other ex-girlfriend. So when you watch that full clip of what Connie said, we just watched it together at the beginning of the stream. This is a different girlfriend. And I've since learned many names of girlfriends. Jeannie, Connie, Phyllis, Ashley. So that's two of them now saying that he was, uh, he stalked, he harassed, he was violent. He dragged her by her hair. Um, that they think when they saw the picture that that was Rod Logan, a bridge guy, right? So that's two girlfriends and a cousin that thought bridge guy was Rod Logan. People that actually knew him. So, you know, over the years, people say, well, how can they have like this picture of bridge guy? All this time and no one comes forward and says that's him well people just come forward 13 in fact i think they're saying in this document right here and who knows how many more after that saying that's him <laughs> just so you know they did okay so during their relationship logan had dragged her out of the car by her hair she still fears logan has no contact with him in two years told interviewers that logan had told her in the past that he could kill her and no one would find the body now if that's true if he says you know i could kill you and no one would find the body well, if he, if he then killed the girls, I don't think he'd put their bodies just out there and open like that. See what I'm saying? Based on what he's telling his ex-girlfriend. But then I would say, well, who knows what, what, he, what else he got up to. And maybe he thought, oh, crap, people are going to think I did this. How am I going to explain this? And then he freaked out and called his cousin. I don't know. Now, during her March, this is the other ex-girlfriend, not Connie. During her March 8th, 2017 interview, she said that she knew Logan carried a gun everywhere he went. Don't many guys in Indiana? Delphi, Indiana? Uh -huh. Eye of a Poppus knows a lot about this case. Says, no discovery of clothes or bodies. 2.13. The search resumed at 7 a.m. on 2.14. The clothes were visible from 75 yards away, yet the bodies were found eight hours later. Even that is weird. I know, right? Good point, good point. Okay, so... Let me see. Lambert Co. says, R.L. admitted to driving to the dump in the morning. L.E. does not care if you drive 10 miles or 100 miles. If he admitted to driving in the a.m., why would he need an alibi for the afternoon? I mean, it's definitely a red flag. <laughs> it would be really weird to be like, no, there's nothing to see here. There's no red flag. Nothing. I don't know. It's pretty sus. But yet they looked into him, didn't arrest him, didn't charge him with these murders. So... As much as it's weird, why would they? Why would they? If Ron Logan is the bridge guy, if Ron Logan has anything to do with these, had anything, because he's now dead, had anything to do with these murders, why would law enforcement not pursue him? 
Why would they then pursue all those other guys we saw? Then Tony Klein and Kevin Klein and then Richard Allen. Make that make sense because I'm not too sure what to think of that. If it's so obvious, <laughs> wouldn't they have had him by now? I mean, he died in 2022. That's like five years later. Anyway, so Connie also said he carried a gun and a knife everywhere, right? This is a different girlfriend saying he carried a gun everywhere. Now, one more time for people who think, well, Ron Logan was at the aquarium shoppy that day or whatever, right? <laughs> buying tropical fish, which is actually, that's a really weird alibi. <laughs> to be like, you know what? I was out buying tropical fish. Okay. Why? <laughs> Why were you doing that? But okay, maybe it's just a random day for a 77-year-old man. He's like, I'm going to go buy some tropical fish right now. Just where'd you call your cousin the next morning and like, oh, you need to tell the police this and this and this. Megan, welcome. Ken Dalton says cops can get it wrong sometimes. Nice to see you. And you're an OG. And true. They can. Um, so they said um, a call placed. Wait, are we there? I just want to find my place. Okay, yeah. A call placed using Logan's cell phone produced cell tower data that shows Logan's cell phone appears to be in or around his property on February 13th, 2017 at 2.09 p.m. They say it was around 2.13 p.m. that the man was walking behind Abby and Libby on the bridge. So can Ron Logan like expedite there in four minutes? I don't know. But anyway, at 2.09 p.m. he was around his property. Although his exact location cannot be confirmed, the tower data shows, so he could be on the bridge is what they're trying to say. Although his exact location cannot be confirmed, the tower data shows that Logan's cell phone was in the Delphi area, in the area of Monon High Bridge Trail. Now, if he was on his property, let's say he's not on the bridge, and somebody is like, leading them across the creek in broad daylight, I still find it weird that no one would see these girls and a guy with a gun crossing the creek. Also, the victim's clothing, not wet, from what we've read from that Frank's memorandum that was put out there. Weird. And then, on top of that, I'm losing my train of thought because I'm visualizing all this. It's a lot. Did you ever feel like you just, like, <laughs> you reach a ceiling with that rabbit hole and you're just like, oh my word, this is a lot. Okay, so crossing the creek, broad daylight, and then no one's hearing screams? And then there's some rumors of screams at like 2 or 3 in the morning? But yet the search is supposedly going on all night? What? It's just very strange. I mean, what was that all about as well? When I was watching the late, I think it's the latest, I'm not too sure, Delphi After Dark episode with Rick Snay, he was saying there were rumors that there were, uh, there were screams at 2 or 3 in the morning. And that somebody had called the police to say, hey, I'm hearing screams, like, you know, can you come check it out? And they're like, nah, nah, we're not going to check it out right now. Almost like they don't have staff to check it out, whatever it was. But like, aren't there people already out there? Weren't they supposedly searching all night? Apparently not. Apparently not. Ken Dalton says, thank you, Grizzly True Crime. Definitely an OG. I remember you from way, way back, like beginning days. <laughs> you know, like when it's the first hundred in chat. I remember that. Okay. So he was on his property at around that time. Well, the property, the radius could obviously be, as we know from other cases, it could be like a five mile radius. Anyway, so they said an analysis of Logan's cell phone data revealed a text message sent from his phone at 7.56 p.m. on February 13th. Initial examination of this indicates that his phone was likely outside of his residence in the proximity of where. Now, how did they know that? If they can't narrow it down exactly, how do they know that his phone was uh, in the... We've got a Freddy here too. I brought Freddy from the Netherlands. Freddy's a little... Nat. <laughs> okay, if you guys know, then you know. So anyway, uh, that's why I'm doing this, in case you wonder. So, I don't know how they know that he'd be exactly there outside, and then again at 10, 16 p.m., but he's on back on his property, as he said he was, okay? Now, what's the point of reading all of this? It's just that it's, it's interesting, and I understand why the conversation keeps coming up. I wouldn't be surprised if it comes up every year. I wouldn't be surprised if there's more documentaries made, Netflix, whoever, and they go with this, because it's interesting get that. But law enforcement looked at it. He didn't get cuffed. He didn't get charged with murder. That helps me think about it differently. Unless, unless, I don't know, why would they not? I want to know then why would they not? And why would the defense not go down that road then if it's so obvious? So when Ron Logan was very violent with his ex-girlfriends, they said he was completely sober, which is quite shocking as well. You know, sometimes when people are extremely abusive, the people are like, well, whoa, what, like, were they drinking? Were they high? What were they? No, no, completely sober, violence. Sure. 
watch something, hey? Fi and me, welcome. Okay, Phoebe says, oh no, read away, gee, I love this information. <laughs> Some people might be like, oh my word, she's going over this again, but it's interesting, okay? It's very interesting. <laughs> yeah, Ken, it's my pleasure. Yeah, Tracy says, Grizzlies are here for the documents. I'm just basically saying, I understand why Connie is saying what she's saying, the ex-girlfriend, because another ex-girlfriend said it here. I understand why the FBI initially looked at Ron Logan. He was one of the first suspects ever, but he didn't get arrested. He didn't get charged. The defense has not gone down that road. That to me minimizes the possibility that he is the killer. Could he be bridge guy? Sure. I've always thought bridge guy could be somebody going guys down the hill and then who knows what happens down the hill? How do we know? We don't know. And the scene makes no sense. Guys down the hill and then what? Then they're running across the creek and then getting murdered right there and then the guy just runs off. It doesn't make much sense. It's it's very difficult to just imagine that. So if somebody said guys down the hill and there's another group of people there or somebody else there or something else happening, I don't know. We just don't know the answers. <laughs> I'm sure that, well, I hope that law enforcement and the prosecution and everybody's got more facts. Okay, so information to be searched and things to be seized. Remember this? All kinds of things. Look at these ones. Any and all evidence pertaining to a murder, including clothing, forensic evidence, blood, seen and unseen. Kind of like he took the deer to the barn, you know what I mean? Hair, bodily fluids, seen and unseen, fibers, weapons, including guns and cutting instruments, electronic devices used to produce the cellular signals detected by law enforcement in the area of the crime scene, animal hair samples. It's interesting, okay? But it feels like Wow, are we back to the drawing board with Ron Logan? Not really. Why are we discussing it? It's because there's a brand new documentary that's just brought it all up again. <laughs> and so we're just going over it again because, you know, now I've already have a hundred emails asking me about this. It's on the playlist. We've gone over this before. But I do find it personally interesting that so many people close to the case, like really, like Barbara McDonald that's been, she was, she's apparently writing a book on the case and, you know, like she thinks, she initially thought, I don't know what she thinks now, okay? Can't speak for her. Initially, I thought she's going to write a book saying Ron Logan is bridge guy. And then you've got that Chris Todd guy that talked about leaked crime scene photos way before the defense leaked photos. He's like, Ron Logan is the bridge guy, you know? And Rick Snay is also a local Delphi After Dark, and he's like, Ron Logan is a bridge guy. <laughs> so I'm like, wow, that's a lot of people very close. And then Connie and... What's the other lady's name? Connie, another ex-girlfriend, and the cousin are like, that's Ron Logan. That's just, that's a lot of people. The FBI is like, that's Ron Logan. Okay, so if Ron Logan were bridge guy, I don't know what that means for the case. I have no idea. What does it mean? Are they more involved? What is it all about? Who knows? It's just very, very strange, right? So all we can do, the best that we can do is report on unfolding events, see the documents that come up, watch the hearings, observe, and really what I wish we could do is just wait to the trial, say nothing until the trial. But unfortunately, there's things that pique our interest and that come up and, you know, I don't want to commit to that because there's things we're going to have to talk about along the way. And who knows if the trial will even happen then. But it just seems like, oh my goodness, this case will go round and round and round and on and on and on. And yes, we hope that Richard Allen survives so that he can have a fair trial. I mean, how strange is it to think that, let me just take this off, to think that even during the Odinist chapter of discussions of this case, that we were like, patches? We're not wearing patches at a freaking prison. <laughs> and then we see, I'm laughing because it's so ridiculous, then we actually see affidavits from those correctional officer, officers saying we do wear patches. We wear our Odinist patches at work. And I'm like, that's so weird. <laughs> Why are you doing that? You know? And I don't know if you saw my community post just a few days ago. There's another group of guys, three guys, that murdered two people, a couple, and then killed a horse as a sacrifice to Odin. You know? And you know what I found interesting is, you know, like, these, uh, it's like a white supremacist prison gang type thing, right? So you see some of the people that are in and out, in and out of prisons, career criminals, busy with either the Aryan brother thing or the Odin thing, they're hijacking belief systems. 
Don't you find it interesting in the Audrey Cunningham case as well? That guy has that nutty tattoo. He's an Aryan brother, Aryan brotherhood, whatever. Who knows if he's into all this? But the point is, ooh, he was getting very antsy around Valentine's Day too. You know, February 13th, 14th, and then things happened to Audrey Cunningham on February 15th. I'm just like, it's really weird. Now, I don't think that's related to the same kind of stuff. I don't think so, but you just never know because he's like a proud Aryan Brotherhood white supremacist dude. It's just weird. There's strange things that are happening with almost like these gangs forming out of prisons. Just remember that. It's like prison gangs, basically, of white supremacists hijacking other people's belief systems because the Odinist thing, even though people are like, I've never heard of it. It isn't new. It dates back way back. The Vinlanders. Odinus, Nordic religions, there's other names for it. Iceland, Germany, lots of Europeans, right? Yes. Okay, so Angelica says there are two bridge guys, right? Not that we know of. <laughs> we do not know that there are two bridge guys. But uh, we could speculate. <laughs> I could stare at that one second clip for a long time and be like, there are two people. <laughs> I've even kept Mr. Grizzly awake at night, <laughs> showing him that bridge guy clip. And I'm like, you see this? Now look at the next frame. You see this? Look at the next frame. And I'm like, is it two people? Is it two different people or one? But even the fact that, you know, how Doug Carter, it kind of implied that the voice you hear might not be the person you see. And I'm like, what are you saying? Like, is guys down the hill, is it one person saying that? Or is guys one person and down the hill another person? Or is it all one person? Which order is it in? And then that one second clip, is it all one guy? It's just, there's too much. They've kept close to the vest, which is probably a good thing. There's probably a reason for that. I hope it's not corruption or some weird brotherhood or something. You know, meaning even the prosecutors at his Masonic Lodge with the same BH guy that's an Odinist. That's weird. So you just never know. <laughs> is it like that, uh, you know, brotherhood or are they like covering for each other or... Are they just keeping things close to the vest because they can't let this out until the trial? I hope the latter. Phoebe says, I, yes, that's why I believe the prison guards are very suspect because I had no, they had no problem uh, showing. And now the one's got that face tattoo on? It's too much. Like this case is so strange. There's no other way to say it. And it's so sad because at the end of the day, a 13-year-old girl and a 14-year-old girl went out on an uh, off day from school. They had pizza and a sleepover. They were chatting and, yes, maybe talking to boys who they thought was um, Anthony Schatz and be like, oh, we're going to maybe meet with him. Because remember, King Klein said that he was going to meet with Libby, but then she never showed up. Weird statement, King Klein. Very strange things that he said, too. So, anyway, and was the last person to speak to Libby? Oh, my God. Like, how is he not in any way tied to any of this? It's just very strange. But anyway, if they were like, yay, they're like talking to this cute boy, you know, on wherever Snapchat, and then they're going out, and they, even if they thought they're going to meet up with this person, who knows? But in their minds, they were just being teenagers, 13 and 14, out for a nature walk, in their little community, feeling safe to do so. They've been there many times. And then the absolute most horrendous thing happened. And I can't even imagine... To me, it doesn't feel like it's just sudden that they just go guy down the hill across the creek and then they get killed. It seems a little different based on everything we know. It could have been prolonged. I don't know, but it sounds terrifying. And I feel so sad for them and their families and friends. It's just so horrifying to think of what this could even be. Yeah, Blueberry Art says it's a bit overwhelming. My brain gets lost in the evidence. It is. And these are the types of things one would think about and that keeps you up at night or that you dream about, right? So AC said it's weird that the prison gang crossed over to the guard. Doesn't make sense. Even that, that is weird. <laughs> it's a bit strange that. Yes, indeed. So uh, Kirsten says, I'm Norwegian and had never heard of Odinus until this case. And to that I say, I understand, but it doesn't mean it didn't exist. Just because people, ha it's not popular, like pop culture or widely known, doesn't mean it didn't exist. It exists. There's people out there with really strange belief systems. You just never know. Okay, everyone. So now what's the time? Perfect timing. So what we're going to do now is I want to say goodbye for now. I will see you again very soon. There's always lots to talk about. I will keep you posted on any upcoming. <laughs> I'm sure there's going to be more. More documents, more things. Let's see, you know, the prosecutor, the defense, and the judge battle it out. And let's hope. I hope there'll be cameras on the 18th. I don't think there's going to be. But I hope there will be. 
Does anyone know if there will be? I don't know that yet. We'll see. Maybe we'll be able to watch it. Maybe we won't. But anyway, March 18th. That's what to remember for now. That's a big hearing for this contemptuous conduct and a big battle between the prosecutor, the judge, and the defense. Will they get fired again? I don't know. Will they all get fired? I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen. But um, I think from what I saw from Bob Motter from Defense Diaries, that document that the defense drew up about the exculpatory evidence would be um, the foundation that they're laying for their arguments to have Nicholas McClellan dismissed, which will be interesting. Maybe it's his turn. Maybe it's his turn, right? Okay. So, yes, just remember, everyone, when I talk about this Odinism thing and it's the white supremacy, they hijacked the belief system. Just remember that. <laughs> so for anyone who's like, no, 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 Odinists, because there are people that will then say, but they're Odinists or they've got Nordic beliefs or Vinlanders, and then they get offended. No, no, no. These are people that hijack it. The same way that, I guess, terrorists hijack belief systems and make it their own, right? And read what they want to from it. Rochelle, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. So, members, we're going to have a stream now. I'm going to show you that R&M Productions episode. And we're going to just look at more of what Connie said because it is very interesting, okay? Steel Guitar says, Odin is the Norse god of war. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, so let's uh, pause for now. We'll come back to it. Let's think about a few things. Leave your comments below. Let me know what you think. And I'll see you again uh, very soon. I hope that there will be justice for Abby and Libby. And let's hope there will be a trial in October. And that it will be a fair one. And that we'll learn more about what really happened here. Because none of it really makes sense, right? Okay, thank you everyone. See you soon. Bye. <laughs>